invite us all to take a moment to just settle in. Watch the breath. Feel yourself arrive here, this moment in this place. Good to see everyone today. <clears throat> We're continuing our, our tour with Master Zazi, and thus have I seen. And we are currently in chapter five. And it's the beginning of her travels through the United States with the big book, the big blue book. And she's traveling with what they call the Dharma propagation team. And the beauty of this, that we've kind of survived through the storms and the challenges up until the point on page 77, if you have the book, to the deserts and the mountains. So she's heading into the desert and the mountains. But before we go there, I just want to take us back to page 74. And we spent a extra minutes on this section, but I want to go back because I invited us all to spend time with the eight fundamental right views of cultivation. And I want to take a moment to read that paragraph that she um, shares just to check in with ourselves. And then I'll ask all of us to check in about how we managed with these right views throughout this last week. So she writes this, in addition to introducing the Buddha, I also introduced his Dharma by presenting the principles and concepts contained in the treasure book as what is cultivation. I explained the eight fundamental right views that were required and the order in which they needed to be practiced. You needed to understand impermanence to have correct motivation. Develop a firm belief to have sufficient determination. Follow with renunciation that forms the causes of liberation, thus enabling you to take true vows that ensure correct action with a diligence that guarantees success. Take precepts to provide correct direction, practice meditation to achieve wisdom and insight and finally, develop the bodhicitta that enables you to become a holy person or bodhisattva and eventually a Buddha. So if you look in that box, the right views, and she suggests that the best way and really the proper way to do this is to go through bit by bit. And where did you see this happening for yourself this last week? The impermanence. I'm sure you saw all week how impermanence shows itself over and over again and what you did with that when that showed up. And then moving through to firm belief and then renunciation, true vows and diligence, precepts, meditation, and then sparking the bodhicitta. So impermanence. Where did you find yourself with her impermanence this last week? Elsie? I had a last minute opportunity to participate in a structural consulting session on Saturday. 
Um, and I had been doing the training with this group 20 years ago. And as I ha <laughs> so you can imagine mm -hmm. <laughs> the amount of impermanence that I experienced with the group because 20 years had passed and it was truly an experience of being someone like many, many identities throughout that time and where I am now and how completely different. Um, I don't even want to say the expression I am now because that's fostering another identity, but what a different place I am in, in my understanding spiritually and uh, where, where, you know, where I am now. So that was really a very, uh, very clear reminder of impermanence. And as you remembering that, it's not just, you know, I mean, 20 years is a long time, but it's like every day when I wake up or even like the three times a day that reflect on our intentions and each, each time it's different changes all the time. What did you do with that impermanence that you noticed? Um, I don't know that I actually did something with it. I think it was just a recognition of it, but I'll think about that question some more. I wonder sometimes with impermanence when it surfaces for us, if there's attachment to clinging, wait a minute, I'm not ready for this. Or I don't want this to go away. Or you know, what, what spurs us down one alley or the other in order to um, either keep us moving down a certain direction that may or may not be healthy or helpful to us. Or the awareness is such, and maybe the belief, the firm belief that I can can do something different here. It doesn't have to be the way I thought it would be. Thank you. Yeah, and then to, I think, a, a recognition of the opportunity mm. for all the other views to be part of that, you know, and how that, that keeps spiraling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Others? I experience impermanence when I realized that the places where I used to go with Santi 10, 15 years ago have closed because of COVID. And it was really a big shock because <clears throat> those places seemed like really timeless. I was going there one time a year and everything was the same. Teachers who had the same place, in the same room, same times, everything was the same. And I haven't been there for like five, five years, maybe, maybe more, like 10 years. And then I heard that during COVID, it stopped, like it was demolished even. So the building is not even there anymore. And that was really like a big shock that, because I saw also myself like one day I'll go back with my kid and he's not there anymore so I felt really disappointed being able to get to that place of disappointment I think is a critical important no. place to be and then what and then what do you do with that where do you go with it because Emotions and feelings are critical. As long as we don't stay with them, hold on to them. But to acknowledge them, oh yeah, I am disappointed. I am fearful. And then what? And then what do you do with that? Where do you go with it? Sticking with what was or moving forward to what can be? Hmm. 
Hmm. So the last couple of days um, were a little bit challenging for me. I found myself falling back into some old patterns of thinking and feeling and doing. Um, impatience with my mom, for example. Uh, and I would, in that moment of impatience, then I would get into this habit of saying bad practitioner. <laughs> and then I would get in, into this um, this kind of spiral where I was like, um, well, with that thought, a lot of things can fall apart. The house of cards can kind of fall. So then I was having to remind myself over and over again of, of the fact of impermanence what I was telling Soma earlier today is that it can feel really, really sticky, like flypaper, some of those feelings and, and thoughts. And as much as I would try to remind myself, it was really, really sticky. And it was really, really hard to pull myself away. But I, I came, where I'm at with this now is one, the, the importance of diligence. Um, and understanding that with those thoughts and feelings, they are ephemeral. There's really nothing there, even though it feels really powerful and strong. I know that it is just a creation of my mind and that it is not real. It's false. So reminding myself of that, having the firm belief in that, renouncing some of those things. I mean, I can go through the whole thing, um, renouncing my attachments to kind of some of those thoughts and feelings. Nevertheless, it's still been challenging. Um, uh, but again, persisting and knowing the truth and take and relying, um, returning to and relying on the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha have been critical. Coming out the other side. Last night, <clears throat> my husband and I were watching a television series that we've been watching for a long time. It's a very sweet series. And one of the main characters died in the series. And I realized this was a real, this, this TV personality, which was just a character. I was attached to that person as much as, as if this was a you or, or you. And and then I got to thinking about, well, what's going to happen when, if my husband dies before I do? It just started snowballing into death. And I've had very close deaths occur in my life before. I'm not new to death. But I've been doing so much studying lately about the impermanence that when we die, I'm aware the personality is gone. But in common, you read about near-death experiences and talk to people who've had them, and people say, well, when I die, I'm going to meet my loved ones. But that personality is gone. So I don't know what happens. I don't remember. But um, I'm still struggling. I haven't gotten past that. Working on it, accepting it, but I'm still attached to or I have those feelings of loss that make me sad. And I'm not, I'm not past that. I don't know how to be, how do you be indifferent? How do you be, I don't know. And that is cultivation. I mean, it's stepping in over and over and over again and not it's staying stuck to the, the fly strap or whatever that's called, the glue strip. It's not um, falling in. I've shared that story over and over again of the five chapters. I walk down the street, I fall in the hole. It's not my fault. I don't know how I got there. I don't know how to get out. I fall down. Chapter two, I walk down the street, I fall in the hole. I see I'm in the hole, but it's still not my fault. I don't know how I got here. Chapter three, Walk down the street, I fall in the hole, I see I'm in the hole, I see how I got here. Chapter four, I fall in this hole, I ask for help, see how I get out. Chapter five, I walk down a different street. That's cultivation. 
and that these eight fundamental right views of cultivation can really give us a roadmap on how to do that. And noticing when we get stuck, if it's just the very first step in permanence, ah, I'm stuck here. I don't want that place to be closed. I wanted to bring my son to that. Why can't my mom just be different? I just spent a weekend with my family. I hadn't seen them in seven months. And my niece, who's 19 and a half, said, oh my God, still? You know, I wanted her to be in a different place. I wanted her to not be a 19 year old in the brain. And yet there was this beautiful, sweet, gentle soul that I could also appreciate after I got through the muck of, oh my God, she's still doing, she's still doing that. And I'm still reacting to her still doing that. So we get, we get those moments and we get to participate in our own way of recognizing it and then stepping into it differently. Whether it takes a day, a week. And, and on page 75, on the top paragraph, the last sentence, life and samsara will still bears the suffering of illness pain and death. Sukha, you were just speaking to that. Only when we can escape this realm can we be free. So until then, we're going to keep stepping in and keep practicing, keep noticing, helping each other as Sangha. It was beautiful. I had an opportunity to sit with um, Santi and Lucita and, and talk about just this and our various moments of experiences of and so we get to share that. I get to learn from what they say and recognize it when it comes up. And, and I think it's important to understand the uh, the order. Uh, that's and that's what's really important. And sometimes, you know, so one cup has to fill up and understanding impermanence. That's, it's not impermanence, but it's understanding impermanence. And when it overflows, it overflows into firm belief. So one establishes firm belief when they have understood the truth of impermanence. And before that, when you don't understand the truth of impermanence, it's like your stories, your chapters, then firm belief cannot come about. And so there'll be continually the questions of why this is happening to me, or maybe not even the question, why is this happening to me? It's like, it's just somebody else's fault, not even a why, you know? Um, and, and if we don't take this in order, and this is where the discipline comes in because we like to do things our way or, or whatever we think or whatever we're into the flavor for the day or for the year, you know, and we just get myopic around, around that, you know, but uh, what he's encouraging us is that there's a certain order in which if you watch a baby first, you know, baby try, crawls, you know, then he starts to try to pull himself up in the chair. Then he jumps and keeps plopping down. Now he finds he can fall without danger, you know, and he gets a little, you know, and he takes his hand off the chair. Then he starts to walk, but he doesn't just start walking. You know, there's these steps he goes through that he gains more and more confidence, more and more sure of, of the way, even though he doesn't know what it is. He, and as he progresses, in that way, things in his life start to change. Even when there's the ripening of, of karma, that uh, unfortunate karma, and one has to experience the suffering of that um, or has to experience that, it does not have to be suffering for them. They can ex experience it without the suffering because they have understood all the steps and uh, they have some mastery of all the steps that come before. So when they get to this place, they are able, they're able to handle it. Sometimes even right now, a thought comes to me concerning Panya Deepa. And I asked Kay uh, yesterday, I said, Kay, did Panya Deepa say anything to you the day before he died? I said, uh, because I don't recall him saying anything to me. 
And she said, no, he was unconscious. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. And so that was, that was the end of it because I was longing to remember something, a word that he said, or at least inquiring, like, have I forgotten already? You know, and she said, no, he didn't say anything. He wasn't talking to him. I said, oh, okay. And that was the end of it. Mine couldn't come with any other trip because there was nothing else there was nothing else, you know? And so in this way, but if we're not built up for it, then we're not gonna be able to handle it when these things come. And so he teaches us a step-by-step -step method by which we can uh, mature so that we're not lacking in anything when the time arrives is that we need it. I, I just wanted to say that I, um, I, in my cultivation, I'm the kind of person that does tend to jump to the back of the book that you talk about. <laughs> and um, and I've realized that kind of have to start from the beginning and take each, like uh, basically what you're just saying. So really, really understanding impermanence. And so being able to go through that natural progression and having patience with that natural progression um, has been something I've realized. Anyone else? Again, I, oh, go, go ahead. Man. I think I had a lot of thought about impermanence yesterday, um, decompressing from an event from the weekend and just how, you know, everything's in the flow and all of a sudden you got to pack it up and move on. And there was a lot of joy and celebration and a lot of education and a lot of learning. So I went through this whole journey of like what happened that was beautiful, what happened that could lead to improvement, but ultimately it was the impermanence. It's like, got to pack it up, got to move on. That was awesome. But we got to pack it up, we got to move it on. And it really just like, why do we have to pack it up? Why do we have to? <laughs> but it made me think about it. You know, it just, it, it really like clicked. And I guess that's what impermanence is. You know, it's just like, it's just allowing, empowering the next opportunity or one day there's not going to be in the next opportunity. But enjoy it while you have it. You know, be in it. And I guess also Ram Das, be here now, be in that moment. But once it's, you know, done, you move on to the next. It's a constant shift. You don't stay there, you know. Thank you. And so I, I'm just going to uh, encourage us to, to read this again and again and again to remind us and check in with ourselves about where I'm at at any given moment, which will allow me to really be present with what is. So I'm gonna invite us to move over to page 77 and deserts and mountains <clears throat> and start reading that section. Someone with a book like to read the uh, first couple of paragraphs. Oh, my. <laughs> uh. <laughs> 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 I remembered passing through the desert 25 or so years earlier and stopping near the Mojave National Preserve on I-40 on my way to Cuesta, New Mexico. I pulled into a roadside restaurant and took a brief nap under a pepper tree. 
I always traveled with a pillow and a blanket as I had become increasingly prone to stop for naps when I drove. As I woke up from my nap, the light beings revisited me as before in Mexico. Only this time, I was able to communicate with the pepper tree I had been sleeping under. In fact, I could communicate with anyone anywhere in the universe, or so it seemed. It was part of the initiation process and a very special sort of supernatural state. I was aware of the possibility of such altered states of consciousness and that other states of existence or realms actually existed and I could go there. At that time, I had no idea how you achieved that state or that this was one of the six supernormal powers that holy beings have. These supernormal experiences appeared to be random occurrences, and I found out the result of spiritual work I had done in learning and practicing the Dharma in past lives. It had to be. I certainly was not living in accord with the Dharma at that time, but my good karma was maturing. We were anticipating hot weather, really, really hot weather for this part of the tour. When I had been in Las Vegas in March for a weekend intensive, I was told horror stories about Las Vegas in the summer. Steering wheels so hot you had to wear gloves to drive. People sleeping during the day and doing their shopping or errands at night when it was cooler and so forth. This was mid-August, but we were lucky. Or was it something else? We had near-perfect weather for the entire trip except when we got the tail end of a couple of hurricanes, a tornado that missed us and some dramatic hail and thunderstorms that were more drama than inconvenience. The weather could not have been better. We were truly blessed. While in Las Vegas, I explained at a public meeting the importance of Georgie Chang Buddha in all the various traditions of Buddhism, and answered questions about esoteric Buddhism to representatives of many of the local Buddhist groups and others. I stress the importance of learning the fundamental teachings of the Buddha that are common to all forms of practice prior to receiving the secret esoteric practices. I also talked about how when, when, fo when one follows the correct Dharma, one receives the blessings of holy beings who will guide one in one's practice. So I want to just pause there for a minute and, and look at that particular section. I stress the importance of learning the fundamental teachings of the Buddha that are common to all forms of practice prior to receiving the secret esoteric practices. And that's what we've been doing. That's what we've been studying is the preliminary practice stepping in closer and closer to prepare ourselves. It's what uh, Venerable was just saying about the baby that needs to learn to crawl before they get up and start walking and not go to the back of the book, but begin at the front of the book. So learning these practices, spending time with them and sensing into them, experiencing them before moving forward. And knowing when that happens, whether the teacher's saying it's time, you're ready, or yourself really knowing, okay, I think I'm set, I'm ready to go, or I think I am. You want to continue to finish that paragraph? I also talked about how when one follows the correct Dharma, one receives the blessings of holy beings who will guide one in one's practice. When the photos of the pictures of the event were reviewed, there were mandalas and orbs everywhere. It was as if holy beings from another realm had come to listen to the Dharma and bless those present. This phenomenon continued to appear at many of the places where we presented the treasure book or when I gave a presentation of H.H. H. Dorji Chang Buddha III and his teachings. Comments, questions? OK. 
carry on. Someone else want to continue with the next paragraph? So when we had the youth program, and Wendy will remember this, we had a, a non-alcoholic uh, club for them, you know, a dance hall where they could play, and we would have raves. I'm going to tell you, you took pictures in there, and the room was full of orbs, you know, because these are, are beings that take delight in the joy, you know. So um, I would, I... Um, Sometimes in there, uh, when we say holy beings, there are different definitions of holy, you know, but sometimes if one is just imbued with a kind of joy and a freedom, that that is a type of, it's a kind of holiness. You know, it's a level of holiness. It may not be the all-encompassing that, that overcomes obstacles uh, for living beings because they care about living beings but um but it's the the joy is definitely there so you'll see orbs in in clubs and you'll see uh orbs in the temple that well orbs orbs in the sky when when you took that photo right after deepa was uh, carried out and we looked at the picture later and there there was this green orb besides it lights everywhere it was remarkable it show up somebody wrote me somebody wrote me um he, he her her banner is i see dead people you know um and uh she's a, a psychic here and she said i saw this whole parade of perfection you know of of uh holy beings waiting to receive Hanukkah, but they had been waiting for him. And uh, and she said, I didn't know what it was. So what I did was I Googled. And she said, when I Googled, I saw a particular Buddhist parade. And then I knew what it was that I saw in the sky. And so and she just wanted, you know, wanted me to know that. It was a parade. Because she said, I've never <laughs> seen a, a Buddhist parade but, uh, or anything like that. But she said it was when they welcomed to me that they consider highly realized. She said, but this wasn't a human, human parade. It was a heavenly parade. Um, when she told me that, I was like, that's really good. But he still hasn't talked to me yet. <laughs> <laughs> he has since then. But at that time, I don't want him to talk to me. You. <laughs> So I guess as we've been talking about um, throughout this book and before, our willingness to open up and see what's beyond what we believe to be true and only this to be true. What else is there that could teach us and support us and help us grow in the ways that we should be and would like to be moving in the direction that we're moving. In the... Um, box below um, on that page 78 bodhicitta is actual is a is actual conduct based upon great compassion that aids living beings in becoming buddhas or bodhisattvas is the mind of love in the holy sense that the enlightened and the unenlightened or the holy and the ordinary both have and it just it just connected with me as we were talking. Um, someone want to continue reading? This was the fourth chapter or the paragraph there. This was the fourth or fifth time I had seen such phenomena. The first time was a few years earlier in San, San Diego when a large mandala appeared over my head and a smaller one over my left hand, which I use in healing and where I always wear my rosary or mala. This was in a photo taken while I was having dinner with other healers. The second time I actually saw them while in the mountains back of Pasadena. I had taken a short nap in my car prior to driving home. And as I woke up, I saw two of them in the car. The third time they appeared in photos taken by one of my students. I had asked my Buddha master about this. The Buddha seemed pleased to hear of them and said that some of them were probably Dharma wheel mandalas. The Buddha also told me that they were just phenomena and not to give them too much consideration or become attached to them. 
Another Vajra brother said this sort of phenomenon was really quite common. I'd forgotten. I had also seen many of these magical orbs on photos of Rinpoche's in Tibet. Another of my students told me later on the trip that when he was visiting the holy pilgrimage sites in India and Nepal, many of his photos exhibited these phenomena as well. For my visit to Colorado, I had the International Buddhist Sangha Association send a copy of the book, His Holiness Dorji Chang Buddha III, to the USAF Academy Cadet Chapel. I wanted to see if they had received the book and what sort of Buddhist program they had at the academy and how we might fit into that program. When we visited the academy, we were also able, quite by accident, to present a copy of the treasure book to the wing commander of the community chapel for their interfaith library. This was one of the many serendipitous events whereby we set out to do one thing, got lost, and found something quite wonderful in the process. The campus of the academy is quite extensive, and although the cadet chapel is visible from many vantage points and quite unique, it is not so easy to access. Many of the original roads had been blocked and the maps had not been changed to reflect these adjustments. So we were hopelessly lost. And when we asked a jogging officer, he sent us to the wrong chapel, the community chapel for the officers and staff and not the famous cadet chapel that we were looking for. Once there, we were most fortunate to meet assistant chaplain, Matthew Jones, who just happened to be a very fine young Buddhist from Texas. He knew all about the Buddhist program at the academy and wanted us to meet his commanding officer to whom we gave a second copy of the treasure book. In fact, Chaplain Jones wanted us to stay and attend the service that they were having that evening at 6.30. We declined as we were on a tight schedule and needed to reach the Unitarian Church in Colorado Springs to make arrangements for the next night's presentation. We did visit the famous Cadet Chapel before we left for our next stop. In Colorado, some of the team visited the great stupa of Dharmakaya at the Shambhala Mountain Center near Red Feather. The 108-foot monument to the late Shogyam Trungpa Rinpoche was the largest stupa that the group visited, and it's pictured in figure 27. Shogyam Trungpa Rinpoche was one of the first lamas to popularize the Tibetan form of Vajrayana teachings in America. The nun, Zheng Zhang, she had a bright, bright pink pillar of light appear intermittently in a video she took of this stupa that was similar to those we saw at the Zwanfa Institute and elsewhere. The Dharma propagation tour had crossed the desert and the continental divide and been blessed with many auspicious signs. We had visited three state capitals, Salt Lake City, Denver, and Cheyenne, and the major cities in the region like Las Vegas. It was now time to follow the scenic Arkansas River into the wilderness and cross the spectacular Sangre de Cristo Mountains into the headwaters of the Rio Grande. This was believed to be one of the most spiritual places in America. It is said that dragons still roam freely in these mountains and earth spirits can sometimes be seen even by ordinary people. How would the local earth spirits, dragons and devas respond to the good news that His Holiness Dorji Chang Buddha III had incarnated to help living beings in their evolution? to higher levels of existence and in the elimination of their suffering? After all, earth spirits, dragons, and devas were living beings and spiritually evolving too. So she continues on in her traveling and everywhere she goes, there they are. There they are. And the stupas, the temples, libraries, chapels, they encounter beings, holy spirits, and learning. And she says earlier they got lost, but found something quite wonderful in spite of it all. And I think that that helps us to look towards, it's an example of how just because we think we're heading in one direction, there's possibility for something else if we're open to it. And one of the things I really appreciate about her book is opening up these possibilities every turn she makes throughout her travels so far. Any other comments? Yeah. Light beings are attracted to frequency and vibration. And so, 
vibration is a form of cymatics. Um, and I feel, not only feel, I have to ask, I'm sure other people have seen in this room other beings. And so I like how she talks about the light beings because light is frequency and frequency is sound. Um, and so that really resonates what she says with seeing the orbs and seeing the pillars of light, which could even be called the violet ray. It's a higher dimensional spectrum. And that could open up a whole other can of worms, but I resonate totally with what she said. Frequency is a version of what? Frequency is not only sound. It's not only like when you can see a waveform or, you know, a sound travel, which you can't unless you have synesthesia, but frequency is an energy. Like a vibration of high spiritual thought or energy. And so it emanates sometimes in a form of light. At least that's my understanding. So I'll invite us, unless there's someone else, to move on to the Rio Grande. And what I think I discovered in my own direct experience is that uh, sound actually supersedes light. We think light is the highest, but actually it converts to a sound. And if you do like the Kuan Yin practice, you know, you uh, there are the sound of the spheres and that's how you exit out of the, the, the crown uh, the crown chakra, um, is that, uh, but that was, that's my experience. Yeah. Yeah. But if people just got to the light, that would be good. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, and so sometimes we talk about, we talk in different words and different languages, but if we get bogged down in, in our, in our differences about, the wording, you know, we'll miss, a, right, the bus will be gone and we'll, we'll miss it. So it's not really about the words, it's actually being able to enter into, into this uh, in, a, in a living way. Uh, so like Wendy says all the time, like water is a thing with 70% water, but water is a part of form, like the other um, uh, uh, aspects of, of earth, air, and fire and space. But then that's just one fifth of our composition because we're form, feeling, perception, um, uh, thought, and consciousness. And so for me, the highest is consciousness, which is not water, but water is important within the sphere of form. So we have to work with both that which is form and and those four other those four other aspects, you know. And that's where. No, we start parceling and breaking off, or teachers do according to the propensities of their students and how they un understand, you know, how they understand something. It's also why there is sometimes a great difficulty in people who are you not know, good hearted people who are um, reaching for the highest um, goals, but yet they can't dwell. Um, together because they are of a certain propensity and um and this can be a a, a karmic condition or self-imposed decision but it keeps us from coming together and mutually mo moving forward because we want to stay stuck in those things that are personality driven and we have to surrender that so in terms of the five vidyas, we're developing that so that we're not staying stuck in the particular one that's familiar or easiest for us. We want to step into and develop those 
other parts to be able well, to. Well, actually, the five vigils manner manifest. We do have to develop them, right. but they are what's resident and available uh, to uh, help living beings. And we don't may not even know we have that that skill or that capacity, but that breaks forth due to our our compassion. And our compassion can only break forth, or our, our bodhicitta can only break forth through step number seven, mm -hmm. which can only break forth through step number six, six, right? Five, four, three, two, one, you know, dealing with impermanence. And so that's why it's so important, or we will maybe make some progress. We may go even very far, but we'll never break forth into the pure bodhicitta because we will have limited or cut ourselves off due to our propensity, our, our lower propensity as a quote, uh, human or star seed, you know? So either one uh, will create an obstacle for us if we're not even willing to surrender that identity. Well, can we There's a scripture that says the keys of the kingdom are through water and spirit. So that's what, when Paniwani was talking about that, that's what I just thought of. We're closing in on the end of our time. Let's travel into the Rio Grande Valley. Is someone ready to read the beginning of that? One of the most intensely spiritual areas that we encountered on the tour was along the Rio Grande River in Colorado and New Mexico. More than a third of the major stupas that we visited in America were in that area. We experienced more supernormal phenomena in that area than anywhere else and had some of our best responses to the teachings. Some traveled several hours to hear the presentation a second time. There were those who immediately felt the karmic affinity to the practice and wanted to take refuge. Out of this leg of the tour, the Tao Xi Jing Institute took form and came into being as a Dharma center to help others learn about the practice and to start their cultivation according to the teachings of His Holiness Dorje Chang. Is it Chang or Chang? Dorje Chang. Dorje Chang. Oh, okay, because I hear Chang and I hear I wanted to say it correctly. Chang Buddha the Third. We enter the headwa headwaters of the Rio Grande, located in the San Luis Valley an area between the Continental Divide and the Sangre de Cristo Mountains in Southern Colorado. At the beginning of our tour and came back up the Rio Grande River several months later, when we returned to the West Coast through El Paso, Texas and Albuquerque in Santa Fe, New Mexico. It should not be surprising that this area was so special. Crestone, Colorado is after all, one of the most sacred settings in America the Hopi, the Navajo, the Ute, the Apache, the Pueblo Indians, and other native tribes have all considered the San Luis Valley where Cristone is located as holy land. Buddhist leaders have likewise recognized the spiritual power of this place and erected stupas and built retreat centers here. The San Luis Valley sitting at a little over 7,000 feet elevation and surrounded by over 12,000 foot peaks serves as the beginning of the Rio Grande River that flows south through New Mexico and forms the southern border of Texas and the US as it meanders eastward to the Gulf of Mexico. We stayed at the White Eagle Village just outside of the tiny village of Crestone where the clouds were so close you could almost touch them. The clouds did not touch the mountaintops and often obscured the Sangre de Cristo peaks. It snowed in the mountains while we were there in August. A self-proclaimed druid, looking as old as the hills and just as tough, when we met at a local coffee house over breakfast, told us that these would be months of temperatures in the double digits below zero. 
the same wise and character and the entourage that seemed to gather for his sake, sage advice, also told us about a local dragon and other earth spirits who could often be seen around 4 a.m. dancing in the mountains. Suspecting that this just might be tales fabricated for native tourists, some of us were still curious enough to get up early and go up on the roof of the lodge to meditate and wait for a glimpse. The energy was so intense and the place so magical that anything seemed possible. I don't think any of us saw a dragon, but there were some pretty mysterious lights that appeared about that time of day that didn't seem to have any normal cause. I saw both red and yellow lights and another team member saw other lights from a different location that could not be explained by anything we understood. Perhaps it was the dancing dragon. Someone else want to continue? There are many types of dragons, such as heavenly dragons, water dragons, spirit dragons, etc. They are all called dragons. They are different from humans and as much as dragons, unlike most humans, can exist in different realms. Heavenly or celestial dragons belong to the heavenly realm, the heaven realm, while spirit dragons, nagas, belong to the naga palace located under the ocean. There are also dharma protecting dragons, spirit beings. Dragons are divided into beneficent and malicious types. The beneficent type is a spirit being. The malicious type is an evil spirit. This is how they are primarily categorized. Those dragons who are at a low level, for example, have just started to practice. They are not developed yet. These are the evil ones. Actually, some dragons can also be categorized as part of the animal realm. It was to the Nagas or spirit dragons that Shakyamuni Buddha entrusted the great Prajnaparamita teachings when he gave them on Vulture Peak and predicted that Nag Nagarjuna would incarnate to retrieve these teachings about 500 years after the Buddha left this world. Nagarjuna was a famous Indian Dharma king from the first or second to third centuries. He founded the Madhyamaka school, he was one of the 17 great panditas of ancient India. He wrote the fundamental wisdom of the middle way that is still one of the classical commentaries studied in Buddhist monasteries. He is often portrayed with a halo of a snake symbolizing the Nagas from whom he, retained, he obtained the great Prajnaparamita sutras. There are other accounts in the sutras and literature of the East where Nagas are mentioned as protectors of the Dharma or the Buddha. For example, the Naga king Mukalinda came and protected the Buddha by spreading his body over the Buddha's head then when a thunderstorm broke out while the Buddha was meditating in Bogaya. The statues and paintings that show what appears to be a giant cobra poised over the, Buddha's, the Buddha are actually of Mukalinda. The Buddhist temples of Cambodia and Thailand are filled with statues and images of guardian Nagas. We visited such a statue at a Cambodian temple in Fresno later in the trip. Uh, and it talks about a, how the figure on page 23 is a photo of a guardian stone at the entrance of the famous Sri Maha Bodhi tree in Sri Lanka that contains an image of a Naga protecting a Devic being. Many of my students and other Vajra brothers and sisters once boarded two large boats and went out to sea off the coast of Southern California to witness a ceremony performed for a certain dis disciple to beseech the blessings and assistance of the Nagas to raise the consciousness of the disciple's parents. At that time, a request printed on yellow cloth was lowered into the ocean. After the appropriate chanting and rituals was raised back up with a message from the Nagas granting part of the request. The printing on the cloth had actually changed while it was underwater. I remember that this Rinpoche carried this request from with, with her for several days. I was told she even slept with it, never being separated from its message. Many of the close disciples of the Buddha were able to have consciousness or souls or of family members raised to higher levels. The Buddha did this for my parents who had passed on some years earlier and for an aunt and uncle who had left this world while I was with the Buddha. So much of our practice involves developing deep compassion for all living beings. We start seeing everyone as our mother of, or our parents and contemplating how they sacrificed their lives for us, loved us, worked long hours and very hard to support us and take care of us. 
Then we consider the fact that all beings have at some point, have at some time been our parents. Thinking in this way, we develop our bodhicitta and intense motivation to quickly become enlightened so that we can help them. We really do want to help all our relatives, all living beings. Right there, I would like us to look at the last part of that paragraph. And she's helping us step into the practice, starting to develop that bodhicitta by acknowledging our parents and acknowledging the work that they've done, regardless of what we may or may not have in relationship to them. And it wasn't until I was really doing this work that I was able to get beyond some of the stuck places I think I still harbored, even though I thought I was beyond to my growing up years. And there was nothing devastatingly bad that I experienced, but I didn't give my parents the honor and the appreciation, the gratitude for all that they had done. And where I visited, went back to visit the work that they did and how they did it, that I really saw it with different eyes and a different lens with that. So I really appreciate her stepping into this practice and showing us a way to do this right here in the middle of her, her travels. Um, I'm aware of our time and I'd like to end in a reasonable time. Are there any comments that wanna be made at this point? When she talks about the dragon orbs and crest stone, it makes me think about the brown mountain lights and what's being said about the Vedic connection. And that's in North Carolina. And so, yeah. There are a lot of dragons up there. Uh, and that's where she did a lot of her practice. So, so she has a great affinity. But um, when, when we built the first center, we would uh, we didn't realize that um, members of the Ku Klux Klan was coming, and um, something happened on the property that um, somebody just came and knocked on the door and said, "You're getting ready to do something, and you can't do it right here." do it over there on that on that land because the um there are beings who've been working with ley lines to go to Pinnacle Mountain. They're not going to allow you to build a, a a Dharma Hall right here. And so I said that would be good, except I don't own that land over there. And then the next um week somebody came and visited and she only stayed for two weeks, but when she left, she left me $50,000, uh, a check on the bed, and I immediately bought that lot for $50,000, and that's where we built that, but there was still a problem, and a dragon came up out of the, the ground. Um, her name was Manjushra, and she said she was dispatched to protect the Dharma. And you could, so people would see the dragon moving around the land. Uh, so I went to pick up somebody from the airport and, you know, you can't be talking about these kinds of things, right? And so I'm just driving up the driveway and I had to stop because Manju Shra was going across the, the road and, and he looked at me and I looked at him and I didn't want to say anything. And he said, what was that? And I'm like, you saw something? <laughs> uh, and he said, uh, yeah, you know, the black looked like a panther, except it had three, you know, three, uh, you know, its body has three humps. And I, I said, oh, OK, well, I'll just tell you, that's our dragon. I'll protect the dragon. And, but what he, but the dragon would go and curl up in the Dharma hall in the back in the back right section of the Dharma hall to protect uh, the Dharma and those uh, 
men, I, or I don't know if they were men and women, uh, they uh, got fearful when they would come into the hall and they would leave and never come, never come back. So, so, but the point is that they weren't protecting uh, me. They were protecting, and deeper, they were protecting the Dharma to the extent that the Dharma's in me, I'm protected. You know, so that's what we have to understand about things. To the extent that the Dharma's in us, in us you know, uh, that's our, our protection. Thank you. That note, which is a beautiful note, I'll ask us to take just a minute or two to, to take it all in, everything that we've read, shared uh, during this time together. I now understand the meaning of all Dharma rituals, all of the merit from my reciting, cultivating, and practicing. I dedicate entirely to living beings in the six realms. May quickly realize the unimpeded state. May all my fathers and mothers in the six realms without exception forever and enjoy ultimate bliss and endless longevity. May we all realize holy enlightenment that never ends and attain the perfect Jujing practice of Buddha Vajra. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>